So this video is going to cover techniques that allow researchers to identify and study protein-protein interactions. So uh, the cell on the left, for example, proteins A, B, and C, they are not interacting. Proteins on the right um, have been treated, uh, the cell has been treated with something, and proteins A and B interact. And proteins interact in the cell all the time to uh, study those interactions a very common technique um, is immunoprecipitations. And that allows researchers basically to go fishing for a certain protein and see which other protein comes along. So if you are studying interactions between one protein and another, you're actually doing a co-immunoprecipitation. So looking for two proteins, or even more, to come along uh, during the uh, precipitation process. So precipitation refers to things coming out of solution, things falling at the to the bottom of a tube, for example. The immuno part, uh, we'll see, refers to antibodies. So again, here's our cell on the left, proteins A, B, and C, not interacting. Cells on the right, pro proteins A and B are interacting. C, not playing with them, so that's okay. So immuno precipitations um, typically use antibodies in order to fish out a protein. So that's the immuno part of the immunoprecipitation. So if you're a researcher studying protein A, for example, and you'd like to know what other proteins interact with protein A, you would obtain, either from a company, or you would generate yourself using um, mice or rabbits, uh, an antibody that binds protein A. So this would be an anti-A antibody. The antibody would have antigen binding sites, and that antigen binding site, the antigen, would be protein A. You can make these antibodies by mass-producing protein A and injecting it into rats, or injecting it into mice, injecting it into rabbits, and make, forcing those animals to produce antibodies against the protein that you're interested in. So here is an antibody that binds the A protein. And you can use it to go fishing for protein A, and whoever tagged along with protein A. So um, if you're just using an antibody to pull down a protein, you're doing an immunoprecipitation. And on the cell on the left, you would uh, immunoprecipitate protein A. On the cell on the right, if you went fishing, or um, Im you tried to immunoprecipitate protein A, it would bring down protein A. And if you uh, did this under the right conditions where you're preserving protein-protein interactions, protein B would come along for the ride. So it would be co-immunoprecipitated uh, with protein A. So protein A and B would both be captured in this fishing experiment. So let's look at a Western blot and how a researcher might publish this in a paper. So um, we're doing a Western blot for proteins A and B and C. And sometimes, uh, we've talked about Western blots in a previous video, uh, Western blots um, detect levels of protein. Sometimes they're referred to as immunoblots, because they, in fact, use antibodies to detect the protein. So if you see IB or WB, they refer to immunoblots or Western blots. But we, as, we've, as we've learned in the past, those are methods to detect the level of a protein. So... Um, Typically, researchers, when they're doing these type of analyses, will first just look at total levels of protein to prove that, in fact, proteins are there um, at a certain level. So if we looked at the cell on the left or the cell on the right and looked at the input uh, level of proteins, the normal level of proteins found in those cells, uh, you did a Western blot for protein A and B and C, you'd find all the proteins are there. Now let us say you do an immunoprecipitation using an antibody that is directed against uh, protein A. And the lane that says L, cells on the left. Lane R is that cell on the right. So if you go fishing in the cell on the left for protein A, you will in fact capture and bring it down. And then doing an immunoblot shows you in fact protein A. Oops, sorry. Let me rewind there a little bit. So you're looking at this right here, right? There's protein A being captured. Protein B and protein B and C don't come along for the ride in um, uh, the cell on the left. 
But looking at the cell on the right, if you did an amino, preci amino precipitation for protein A, you would capture protein A, and you would in fact capture protein B. And this would tell you protein A and B are interacting in that cell. They didn't interact before on the left, but they're interacting in the cell on the right. And maybe you have added a drug, or you've added a growth factor, you've done something to that cell to cause the interaction to occur. Protein C does not hang around with protein A or B, so it is not captured. And you can see at the bottom panel, no protein C. So that um, is typically how you'll see it published in papers. Um, you will typically see a control, a negative control, shown when you're doing these types of experiments. And this is using a nonspecific antibody. So it's usually labeled Ig or IgG. It's just using an antibody that doesn't bind A or B or C. And going fishing with it shouldn't capture any A or any B or any C. And so you see in this lane here, if you go fishing with a nonspecific antibody, you don't pull anything down. Let's look at a real example. So I've just found this figure on the internet. And in this paper, researchers are studying a protein SRSF1. I don't know what this protein is. I don't know what it does. But just by looking at this figure, I can figure out what the protein interacts with. So um, they were studying uh, all these other proteins. So on the left, you can see labeled input, are all these other proteins besides SRSF1. So there's RPL5 and 11 and 23. There's a protein called MDM2, P53, and beta-actin. So in these cells that have been added, that have been treated with some drugs, MG132 and or actinomycin, um, the drugs, treating the cells with the drugs, these protein levels don't seem to dramatically change. Again, the panel on the left is just a straight western blot or immunoblot of the total levels of proteins in the cells. So that is the input level. Now, they're going to go fishing. They're doing an immunoprecipitation in cells on the right. So looking at lanes 1 and 2, they are going fishing. They're using an antibody, just IgG, a nonspecific antibody. When they go fishing, what do they pull down? Nothing. Look at all those uh, lanes, uh, western blots for lanes 1 and 2. There's virtually, there's nothing there. That's a negative. That's the background. Now, in lanes 3 and 4, they're going to use an antibody that binds the SRSF1 protein. And don't worry about the drug treatment. It's not really that big of a deal. But you can see when you go fishing for SRSF1 using an antibody that binds it, you, in fact, pull down or immunoprecipitate those, that protein. Not a surprise. Now, if you look at these two lanes, uh, the, uh, those two rows, with RPL5 and MDM2, those proteins are now also present in those samples, especially in lane 4. So what that's going to tell researchers is that the MDM2 protein and the RPL5 protein seem to be in a complex with SRSF1. The other proteins, like P53 and RL, RPL11 and 23, are not in a complex with it. So we can see proteins that do and do not interact with SRSF1. And that's being shown in lane 4. Um, I've shown these proteins interacting this way. You really can't tell what kind of complex. Are they both individually binding SRSF1? Does, uh, do they form a, the, a variety of combinations? Um, do they bind separately? Does SRSF1 bind MDM2 and RPL5 separately? Uh, these experiments might, be, might not be able to tell you that. Um, but whatever, these proteins are interacting. That's great. And if you look in lane 3, there's less of an interaction. Well, maybe that has to do with whatever drug they did or did not add um, to that lane. But that is an immunoprecipitation that allows you to look at protein-protein interactions. There's one last me uh, method that I wanted to show you that examines protein-protein interactions. Um, it has to do more with a pull-down and mapping domains of protein-protein interactions. So, Again, just some figure I pulled off the internet of a paper that studies a protein called the NMNAT2 protein, which I'm just going to call the N protein, interacting with another protein called the SIRT3 protein. So the N protein interacts with the SIRT3 protein. And I can tell this because of this figure on the right is an immunoprecipitation. Although in this um, experiment, the researchers didn't have an antibody that bound the N protein. So um, to get around the, 
the fact that sometimes you don't have an antibody, companies don't sell it, you can try to make one in a mouse or a rat or a rabbit, but those antibodies might not bind with very high affinity, or you want to use a um, another pull-down method that is test well-tested, well-characterized, has a very high affinity, you can basically fuse things onto proteins that you're going to study, and that will allow you to do a pull-down much quicker, and usually with much, much higher affinity. So we, um, you can see here they're doing um, blots for proteins like the CERT protein and the N protein, but these proteins have tags on them. So these are typically uh, fusion proteins. They're proteins that are fused to the protein that you might be studying. So in this paper here, they have fused a flag, <clears throat> excuse me, a protein called flag. It's a very short protein, so actually it's sometimes referred to as a peptide. So they have fused the flag peptide to the N protein, and there are really high affinity antibodies that bind the flag sequence. So instead of generating your own antibody, you can buy these flag antibodies that will stick to flag, and flag is fused to your protein, so you can easily go fishing for that protein of interest. And there are all sorts of other things that you can tag proteins with. You can put a bunch of histidines at the beginning or the end of a protein, that's called a his tag, and it's very easy to pull down something with a his tag because um, many histidines in a row will stick to uh, a um, nickel-coated resin, so you can easily pull down any complexes um, if you artificially tag your protein with histidines. Another common affinity tag is called GST, glutathione S-transferase. So if you fuse the GST protein to some protein you're studying, um, the GST protein sticks very nicely to glutathione resin. And you can use that to go fishing for your protein and anything that sticks to your protein. Um, another common one is called MYC. The MYC protein you can fuse to some other protein and you can go fishing with MYC antibodies. So sometimes you will see um, these experiments called uh, immunoprecipitations. Sometimes you'll see them called as called pull downs, because there you're not using antibodies. Because in, if you're using an antibody, you're really doing an immunoprecipitation. But if you're using these other affinity tags like the his tag or the GST tag, you're pulling down those proteins using like a resin coated in something. So if you're pulling down a his pro tag protein, you're using a nickel coated resin. If you're pulling down a GST tagged protein you're pulling it down using a glutathione resin. So just a variety of ways to capture proteins from cells. So in this experiment here, um, the N protein is tagged with flag. The CERT3 protein is tagged with MYC. Um, so they've got two tags. They're working with two tags here. So um, I'm going to make the CERT protein purple and the other protein, the N protein, orange. Okay. So, here in this lane 2, they are going to pull down uh, or immunoprecipitate using the flag antibody. And if you see the, the words there on the left of the panel, IP, that's immunoprecipitation. So they are you doing an IP using the flag antibody. And if you look at the top there, it shows the N protein is fused to flag. So that's when it says flag NMNAT2, the protein is fused the, the flag, flag peptide is uh, fused to the N protein. And so when you IP with flag, you pull down the um, N protein, and you also pull down the CERT3 protein, because you can see there at that panel on the top, they're doing an immunoblot using the MYC antibody. The MYC antibody will stick to MYC. In this instance, MYC is fused to CERT3. So they've gone fishing for using the flag tag and probe with flag and MYC antibodies. But really, they're going fishing for the N protein, and they are um, using an immunoblot to analyze the levels of the N protein and the SIR protein. And in lane 2, they're showing that those two proteins interact with one another. So they can study protein-protein interactions. There's another really interesting thing that this um, experiment shows, um, and the researchers do this when they want to map the interaction domains. So for this experiment, they were very curious, which part of the N protein, which region in, is the region that mediates the interaction with the SIRT3 protein? 
So they have made um, constructs of the N protein that span amino acids 20, I'm sorry, the first construct uh, spans um, amino acids 1 to 28, and so that's the N um, construct. The next construct spans amino acids 29 to 307, that's the C1 construct. And the last construct is the C2 construct, it spans amino acids 107 to 307. And so if you look here on the western blot, there is the um, N protein, but just amino acids 1 to 28. There on the western blot are amino acids 29 to 307, so just that region of the protein fused to flag. And the final one on the western blot is the uh, C terminus of the protein, 107 to 307. So they're basically making little parts of this protein, not the entire protein. And when they go fishing, using the flag tag, so they're going to do an IP using uh, the flag antibody, they ask, which one of them allows the interaction uh, with CERT3 to still be present? And if you look in lane 4, lane 4 is the only lane, if you look in just at lanes 3, 4, and 5, lane 4 is the only lane that will capture, that captured the um, CERT3 protein. So the conclusion that they can draw from this experiment is that the uh, amino acids uh, between uh, tw amino acid 28 and amino acid 107, that region of the protein is the uh, region that contains the interaction domain between the N protein and the CERT3 protein. Um, so they have now mapped that interaction because the only constructs that pull down the CERT3 protein are the full length protein from 1 to 307, or the uh, fusion 29 to 307, that interacts with it, but 107 to 307 does not. So that region between 28 and 107 must mediate the interaction. So that's a way to map protein-protein interactions. So not just study which proteins interact with what proteins, but now what regions of proteins interact with what proteins. So. These, this video has covered immunoprecipitations and uh, very similarly pull downs. So, another way to capture proteins and protein protein complexes, not using antibodies, but using resins that would bind to proteins. Um, and usually these are artificially fused proteins like the GST protein or a uh, region of histidines that you fuse to a protein. So that's protein-protein interactions, and we will see this in a number of papers that we will read in the future.